It's down there. In the darkness. In the pipeline. Waiting. <laughs> For a period of six weeks from the 16th of March to the 20th of April 1968, the 42nd Doctor Who story, Fury from the Deep, was transmitted on BBC One. But the story behind Fury from the Deep had actually begun some three and a half years earlier in 1964, when writer Victor Pemberton wrote an unsolicited story outline entitled The Slide, which he duly submitted, at more or less the same time, to both the Doctor Who production office and to BBC Radio. Doctor Who story editor David Whittaker subsequently rejected the idea on Thursday the 24th of September 1964, stating that This is rather a stewpot of all the other science fiction serials we've ever done, with bits of Nigel Neal scattered about. I don't think the dialogue is very good and I'm quite sure it's not right for Doctor Who. By this time, however, the story had already been accepted and commissioned by the head of the radio drama script unit, Peter Bryant, for subsequent transmission on the light program. The slide, broadcast in seven parts between the 13th of February and the 27th of March 1966, detailed events surrounding an earth tremor which occurs in Redlow Newtown, situated on the south coast of England. There, a hundred-yard fissure in the earth is discovered, out of which a green parasitic mud begins to seep. You fool! Doctor! Doctor! Hmm? Come quick, please! What's the matter, Inspector? What's happened? Oh, Ted, the old boy, he's gone from the car! What? Disappeared! The car door was wide open! I can't find him but anywhere! He was unconscious, he can't have just walked off! Well, he has! And if we don't get hold of him pretty soon... Oh, what's the matter with you now, Mickey? Shut up! Hey. All of you, listen! What? Listen! Can't you hear it? <sighs> what the... What is it? Give me the torch. Somebody, give me that torch! The road. Look at the crack in the road. It's mud. A slide of mud coming out of the crack. Just look at it. It's uh. all right, Doug. It's all right. Look, it's coming over the top. All the way along. It's coming over the top! The mud! That was episode one of The Slide by Victor Pemberton. To help with the investigations into the earth tremor, the Chilean professor Joseph Gomez is called in, who discovers that the mud is far from inert. Fascinating. But how on earth did you manage to record it, John? It took me over two hours. Every time I put the lead wires in, they just burnt away. Oh. You've got to be so careful the way you handle the stuff. But Joseph, surely this proves beyond a shadow of doubt the mud's a living thing. The way it moves, this extraordinary sound. It proves an awful lot, Robert. But what it doesn't prove is the exact nature and the extent. Now, I think that what we have here goes beyond the normal bounds of clear definition. What do you mean, Joseph? John, let's have that tape recorder on again. But this time, can you see if you can shape the background a little? I don't know. I'll try. Why? What are you thinking? 
Uh, I have a feeling that somewhere in the middle there's there's an indication. There's something staring us right in the eyes. Okay, all set. Uh -huh. <laughs> Yes. Yes, you see? I thought so. What? Sounds exactly the same to me. Listen carefully, Robert. You mean to tell me that you can't hear it? I can. You mean that throbbing sound? That's it. The same rhythmical pulsation. You hear it now, Robert? But I can hear it, but I'm damned if I know what... Yes, I know. I see what you mean now. It can't possibly be a heart. Oh, yes, Robert. Indeed, it possibly can. Every living creature must have a center. It has to. Incredible. It's terrifying. I can't believe it. I just can't believe it. You see now, Robert? It's alive. This monstrous thing is alive. With the mud beginning to control people's minds, Gomez subsequently discovers that sunlight affects the mud's properties. Using the strong infrared discharge from xenon lamps, they manage to knock out the mud's nerve center, thus releasing the population of Redlow from the hypnotic trance that has held them. In order to supplement his income as a freelance writer, Pemberton turned to acting, and in January 1967 was cast by director Morris Barry as Jules in the Doctor Who story, The Moon Base. I, uh, <clears throat> I think perhaps you don't appreciate how serious the situation already is. I think he gets a knighthood. We spent years in the General Assembly negotiating methods of agreement between farmers, landowners, and so on. Meanwhile, Peter Bryant, who had commissioned the slide for radio, had made the transition into television through the head of serials, Sean Sutton. Sutton had offered Bryant the position of Doctor Who story editor, and in turn, Bryant had offered Pemberton a position as his assistant story editor, a role which Pemberton took up from May through to September 1967. Pemberton worked on a total of four stories, from The Evil of the Daleks through to The Ice Warriors, receiving his only on-screen story editing credit for The Tomb of the Cybermen, for which Peter Bryant acted as stand-in producer. Pemberton was subsequently offered the full-time story editor's position upon Bryant's promotion to producer in September 1967, but turned it down, preferring to return to freelance writing. As a result, Pemberton chose to submit a further reworking of the slide to the program, and was commissioned to write the new adventure entitled The Colony of Devils on Thursday the 5th of October 1967. At this point, the serial was assigned the story code QQ, with filming due to be conducted in late December and studio recording in January and February 1968. The director assigned to the story was Hugh David. David had himself been an actor and from 1960 had become famous playing the lead role in Granada Television's Night Errant Limited. During the course of 1963, whilst the first series of Doctor Who was in pre-production, Rex Tucker, who had been assigned as caretaker producer, asked David if he would be interested in taking on the lead role himself. David declined, having not relished the fame that his previous long-running series had brought him. In the next few years, David made the progression from actor to director, and in 1966 he was asked by Innes Lloyd to direct Doctor Who Under the Sea, which would later be renamed The Underwater Menace, but he declined the offer feeling that the concept would be too difficult to achieve. Still keen to make use of his services, David was then offered the director's position on The Highlanders, a post that he duly accepted. Pemberton delivered his scripts for The Colony of Devils at a steady rate, episode 1 being delivered on Wednesday the 18th of October, followed by episode 2 on Monday the 30th, and episode 3 on Thursday the 2nd of November. During the second week of November 1967, the decision was made to drop the Colony of Devils back by one story in the running order to Serial RR, and bring forward the second Yeti story, The Web of Fear, which had been allocated the production code SS. Pemberton subsequently delivered his final three scripts for the story on the 13th of November and the 16th and 22nd of December respectively. Various revisions were made to the scripts early on. The character Mr. Quill was originally named Swan. 
Episodes 4 and 5 featured a subplot involving the seaweed creature's ability to redirect poison gas along the pipeline to any destination they desire, an ability they used to fatally attack a nearby conference of VIPs. And in the final episode, the Doctor sends Jamie back to the TARDIS to fetch some amplification equipment. In doing so, he also instructs him to get his bagpipes and to play them loudly if he's attacked by the seaweed en route. Much to Pemberton's annoyance, the decision was also taken to change the name of his story from The Colony of Devils to Fury from the Deep. Precisely when this decision was taken remains unclear. During the 1960s, the BBC produced regular synopsis of their drama output for the hard of hearing, which were distributed through the Royal National Institute for the Deaf. An advertisement in the Radio Times of the 22nd of February 1968, only three weeks before transmission, offered, among others, the synopsis for the first three episodes of The Colony of Devils. However, the synopsis themselves are clearly based on early versions of Pemberton's scripts, and so the retention of the original title was likely due to the fact that no one had informed the relevant department of the changes. One of the first problems that Hugh David and his production assistant Michael Bryant faced was finding a suitable location for the ESCO gas platform featured in episodes 5 and 6. With real rigs proving impractical on cost grounds, David decided that a suitable alternative could be one of the disused sea forts in the Thames estuary. Designed by Guy Maunsell, the army sea forts had been constructed to protect the estuary from German attack during the Second World War. Built at Gravesend in Kent in 1943, a total of three forts were constructed and situated at Red Sands, Shivering Sands and the Nore. The initial recce of the forts was conducted by both Hugh David and Michael Bryant from a fixed-wing aircraft flown by pilot Mike Smith from Gregory Air Services at Denham Airdrome, the company that would subsequently supply the two helicopters used in the production. After the recce, the decision was made to use the fort at Red Sands, probably because it was the only fully intact structure, the other two forts having been damaged by shipping collisions in 1953 and 1963. For several years, the fort at Red Sands had played home to a succession of pirate radio stations, the final one being Radio 390, who had abandoned the fort some six months earlier on the 28th of July 1967. A second recce was then conducted of the fort itself by Michael Bryant, who flew out with Captain Mike Smith in the Hughes 300 helicopter that would be seen in the finished programme. Smith duly landed the helicopter on top of one of the towers, and the two of them explored the rusting fort. One of the major logistical problems faced by Bryant concerned the use of the foam machine that the visual effects department were going to use to indicate the whereabouts of the weed creature. The plan was to cover the top of one of the fort towers with foam to indicate that it was the nerve centre of the weed creature's invasion. To effectively accomplish this, however, the foam machine required a large supply of fresh water, as it could not operate effectively using the salt water surrounding the fort. To this end, Bryant organised an advanced trip to the Red Sand Sea Fort to deal with the problem. I booked a scene crew we hired sufficient five-gallon drums to make up the 300 gallons of fresh water. We uh, got in a scenery lorry and we all drove down to Margate where I booked a fishing boat. We filled up the drums with fresh water and we got in the fishing boat and it was a very pleasant day and we set sail out for the fort where I knew it would be possible for the six of us to um, carry these water drums up to the top of the fort. Except, of course, we arrived up out of this fort in this fishing boat. Three of the prop men were sick. The other two were looking green, and one of them was saying, I didn't join the BBC to do this, brother. We arrived at the legs of the fort, and, as always, there was a considerable swell. I mean, there was about a six-foot swell. So the fishing boat from the steel ladder was going up and down six feet, and the iron ladder was dodging and the uh, scene crew weren't very enthusiastic. So I stood on the bows of the boat and said, OK, I'll go first and um, the rest of you guys can follow. So uh, I rather foolishly probably um, leapt off the bows of the boat onto the iron ladder 
And the guys said, look, absolutely not. We're not going to do this. It's very dangerous. And I thought about it and went, yeah, this is. I mean, I'm asking these guys to do too much. So the fishing boat came back in and I jumped back off onto the fishing boat and went back to base. We then motored back with the guys still being ill. And we poured the water out of the containers, reloaded the door back into the scenery lorry, and we all drove back to London, which was rather an expensive day wasted. And I still had got the problem. The problem was finally solved by hiring the services of some of the local fishermen at Whitstable, who transported the water containers out to the fort and carried them up to the top of the tower. On Saturday the 3rd of February, the date that episode 4 of the Web of Fear was being recorded at Lime Grove Studio D, Hugh David and his team travelled to Margate and booked into their production hotel, the Nayland Rock. The following morning, having been joined by Patrick Troughton, Fraser Hines and Deborah Watling, filming began at nearby Botany Bay, Kingsgate, on the opening sequences of the story. Pemberton's original script for episode 1 had the TARDIS landing on the edge of a cliff, followed by the travellers climbing down onto the shoreline below. But Hugh David felt that the opportunity beckoned to try something a little more inventive. Something like the TARDIS flying down onto the surface of the sea. Then we came to the shot of the um, TARDIS landing on the sea. So we had this little two foot, three foot TARDIS on a piano wire to be suspended below the um, Hughes 300 helicopter with Mike Smith flying it. So anyway, Mike takes off in his helicopter flies up in the air, flies 100 yards out to sea, lowers the TARDIS in on the end of its 200-foot piano wire, which kept the helicopter out of the top of frame. Fine, fine, fine. TARDIS comes down, lands on the sea, flops straight on its side. Because although the baby TARDIS was made of wood, of course, we hadn't worked out that it wasn't going to float upright. So he flew back, landed. He said, look, I need someone to talk me down so that I can see what it is. So I said, yeah, OK, well, I'll go and do that. So I climbed in the helicopter with Mike, we took off, flew out there, and I sat in the seat beside him saying, down, down, down. But the problem was, which neither of us had really worked out, was from the seats, you couldn't see the baby TARDIS, which was directly suspended by piano wire from the centre of the helicopter. So I said, Mike, I can't see it. He said, oh, well, he said, you'll have to take off the seat belt, take off the safety strap, climb out onto the skid, and talk me down from the skid. So I said, OK, right you are. So I climbed out, stood on the skid of the helicopter, and talked him down. Because I could then see the TARDIS spinning there, and I said, down, down, two foot, one foot, steady, she's there, up a bit, down. And I suddenly realized there I was, connected to the helicopter by only a, a headset, standing on the skid, holding on with one hand, 300 feet above sea level. Madness. I could have been fired from the BBC for such infringements of the safety regulations. But Mike was a great, a great guy, a great helicopter. He knew I was perfectly safe. He would never have asked me to do anything that was... What am I saying? The guy was out of his tree. He was, he was the craziest pilot I've ever met. Nicest guy, brilliant pilot, do anything. In order to get the Doctor and his companions to the beach to begin their adventure, it was decided that a more conventional form of transport could be used. But when filming began, even this was not without its problems. Hugh wanted, Hugh's sort of second <laughs> mind-blowing idea was he wanted the TARDIS to land at sea. He said, why does it always land conveniently at land? Why doesn't it land on the sea? And if it lands on the sea, of course it will float. And then they'll have to come ashore in a rubber boat. And I was going, rubber boats? Oh, no, not rubber boats. He said, yes, yes, yes. He said, that's great. It'll be really great if we can have this rubber dinghy. They can, Pat's, a, Pat's a sailor, Pat's a dinghy sailor, he knows about boats. We'll just have an outboard motor and Pat can drive the rubber, rubber dinghy with he and Fraser on board. So Avon's provided us, I think, with the Avon dinghy and the outboard motor um, was coming from another company, Yamaha or Seagull or something. I can't quite remember where, but that was all being delivered brand new down to Margate for us. Uh, and we were to operate it ourselves. So we started off that day, and there was the Avon dinghy, there was the outboard motor, but Avon's had forgot to pack the outboard motor bracket. 
So we couldn't operate the Avon dinghy with the outboard motor. We had to have Pat row the dinghy ashore, which is what he did. and Seafort, two helicopters were used. A Hughes 300 flown by Mike Smith, which later appeared in both the Demons and the Green Death, and a larger jet-powered Mark II Alouette, which would subsequently appear the following year as the unit helicopter in the invasion. Pilot Mike Smith rapidly made his mark on the cast and crew in a variety of different ways, as assistant floor manager Margot Hayhoe remembers. I will remember the first time we met him in the evening at the bar of the hotel and he had a little party trip and that was eating the wine glass that he had his wine from which is quite an unusual thing to do I think and I remember Victor Madden who played the baddie in that particular episode was in the bar and said to us oh, who is that man who's eating the glass and Michael Bryant said oh that's Mike Smith he's the pilot of the helicopter and Victor Madden went rather pale and very quiet because the next day he was due to be piloted by Mr. Smith and he was just a little bit worried but um, it all went very well the next day and in fact that was one of my first experiences of flying on a, in a helicopter and I made the fatal mistake when I went with Mike we had to take the props from the top of the um, hill at Margate down to the beach never been, having been in a helicopter before I got quite nervous, and as it took off, I was so startled at the way that the earth just fell just fell from my feet, because it was a glass bubble, and I screamed. Of course, this was the signal for him to have lots of little tricks and bounce around in the helicopter, and by the time I got down to the beach, of course, I was a shaking jelly, but everybody else found this terribly amusing, and looking back on it, actually, so did I. For the majority of the flying sequences, the film camera, operated by Ken Westbury, was mounted in the Alouette, while most of the action was accomplished using the Hughes 300. For the Doctor and his companions' escape from the gas platform in Episode 6, Hugh David wanted to emphasise the fact that the Doctor was not at all familiar with the discipline of flying a helicopter. But first, Mike Smith's features needed to be disguised so that he could pass as the Doctor in long shot. I do have a little receipt for a pair of tights that I bought to replace a pair for the makeup supervisor who had used hers to disguise the face of Mike Smith um, as he was meant to be the doctor when he was flying the helicopter, though at that distance I'm sure nobody would have actually seen. One of the ways that the doctor flying the Hughes 300 was meant to escape from the baddie in the Alouette was by flying in between the legs of the fort very, very dangerous, totally against the law. I mean, totally against the aviation, because 27 years later, we're not matter talk about it now. But I mean, what we asked Mike Smith to do was, with the Hughes 300, which has, say, a 20-foot wingspan, was to fly in between legs of a fort where, you know, it's, it's something like 30 foot. I mean, he had a clearance of something like five or six feet on either side. I mean, madness. Absolute madness, very dangerous, totally against aviation laws. And when I remember do discussing it with Mike and saying, listen, you know, we're not forcing you to do this, it's, it's very much optional. And he said, no, 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 that's all right. Yeah, I think we can do that. And Mike was nervous about it. Mike Smith was very nervous about it. Uh, it was about the most, he told me later, it was about the most dangerous thing he'd ever done in his life. And he'd flown in 
career or something. So they flew out and Hugh directed the sequence from the helicopter and uh, they landed back having achieved everything they wanted to achieve, I think, with shots of Mike flying in between the legs. And uh, he landed back at Margate. You know, I mean, Mike Smith was then on a real adrenaline high. He had never done anything like it in his life. And we uh, finished filming that day, went back to the hotel in Margate for the last night before we all traveled back to London. And Mike was in a, an amazing mood. Hugh had gone back to London, and some of the other actors are, but all the makeup, wardrobe, props, me, um, the production, most of the production people were still there. And Mike Smith came in the lounge, which was a rather elegant hotel with a beautiful uh, chandelier in the middle of the ceiling and nice club armchairs and quite a, quite a dignified place. And Mike came in and he ordered a bottle of brandy and a crate of champagne. And we said, well, you know, Mike, Mike, you know, BBC budget. He said, no, 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 this is, this is on me. This is, I absolutely, I've never done anything so clever in my life. So uh, come along, we're going to celebrate the achievement of flying a 20-foot wingspan helicopter through a 30-foot gap. Champagne, brandy arrived. So we had a mixture of brandy and champagne all around. And then he said, right, another crate of champagne and another bottle of brandy. So we had that. And it was at that point that I was sitting in my armchair trying to go, I am a BBC production manager. I have to exercise. I have some responsibility for this. I mean, it was a great evening. A lot of laughter, a lot of fun, really nice people. Um, but nonetheless, we were all getting sort of quite high in a mixture of um, brandy and champagne. At that point, Michael pulled me uh, over backwards in my armchair and then thrust another glass of brandy and champagne in my hand and said, hey, drink that. And I went, well, yes, Mike, thank you uh, very much, but I really think... He said, Michael, don't be so BBC. You've got to live a little. You've got to risk a little. You've got to enjoy life a little. And he said, do you know, Michael, there's something I've never done. I've never swung like Errol Flynn from a chandelier. But tonight, and I said, Michael, please, please don't do it. He said, watch me. And he leapt up on the table, and he was a tall, good-looking guy with a little goatee beard. He said, watch this, climbed up on the table, said, yahoo, jumped in the air, grabbed the chandelier, swung across the room, and the chandelier came out of the ceiling, and three-quarters of the ceiling came down on top of him. La, there was Mike, covered in white plaster, sitting in the middle of this living room floor, whilst the resident, well, what do you do? You have to laugh, don't you? Anyway, he was all right. He wasn't hurt, which was the main thing. I was just left with the slightly embarrassing situation that uh, I had to apologize to the hotel. And they didn't mind. We had been good customers. And it was a great evening. But another thing you learn working in television is don't swing from chandeliers in strange hotels unless you've had somebody test them first. Another important sequence to be filmed on location was the conclusion to episode three, showing Maggie Harris, possessed by the weed, walking into and under the sea. The weather during the early February location shoot was not good, with freezing temperatures and rain adding to the cold coastal winds blowing in off the sea, a fact emphasised by the headline used for a brief interview with Fraser Hines published in the Radio Times. The cold conditions therefore made it an uncomfortable shot for actress June Murphy to achieve, especially when it was realised that the shoreline didn't quite slope as dramatically into the sea as director Hugh David had initially hoped. It was freezing. So what we did was this. I told her to walk into the sea. We put some, we'd sprayed some foam. And the idea is she was going to walk into the foam and just disappear. And I said, just keep walking until you disappear. Behind me, we got the helicopter. There was a hot bath already drawn in the hotel. And we'd arranged for it to land on the ground and uh, a whole lot of warm towels there. So I said, okay, walk, and don't look back. So she started off and went, <laughs> although the tide was far out, he went on and on and on. You know, <laughs> after about half a mile, she seemed to be a foot under it went on. Unbelievable, you know, I was expecting to go down eventually. Till in the end, I had a shout to her to just walk on her knees and then go down on her hands and knees with her head sticking up. Otherwise, we'd never have done it. So it took very much longer than it should have done. But she did that. She came out. We booked her in. She was in the bath in three and a half minutes. The unpredictable weather conditions on location 
also caused other problems, as visual effects designer Peter Day recalls. As the special effects designer, I was given the task of covering one of the old wartime anti-aircraft forts in the Thames estuary with foam to be filmed from the air from a helicopter. I believe it was February when we did the filming and uh, knowing the weather could be changeable at that time of year, we phoned the Coast Guards from the production office in London who at that time of year would only give a 45-minute weather report for the Thames estuary. So I tried to persuade Hugh David to let us make a model of the fort which we could cover in foam and film in controlled conditions in our model studio. But he felt we should do it for real. So, on the day scheduled for filming, we were all set to go, when the weather changed for the worse and I felt it was too dangerous to go onto the fort. Well, Mad Mike, the helicopter pilot, agreed to take the foam machine in his Hughes 300 and cover the fort with foam. So off he went. Unfortunately, the second helicopter, an Alouette, carrying the camera crew, developed engine trouble, was un unable to take off. And at that moment, a storm blew up and Mike Smith was given 10 minutes to take off so he left the equipment and flew back to shore immediately and the local fishermen recovered our rather rusting equipment some two weeks later when the storms had abated. During pre-production Deborah Watling had made it clear to Peter Bryant that she wished to leave the program at the end of Fury from the Deep. As a result Hugh David had the responsibility of filming Victoria's farewell scene whilst on location. As the TARDIS had descended onto the sea at the beginning of the first episode, it was decided that it should leave in the same manner, emphasising the fact that Victoria was being left behind with the Harrises. I, I wanted to get the feeling that it was really going up like a, a rocket and leaving this girl behind, that was the important thing. And it was rather a plaintive shot because as it was this terrible weather, nobody was walking on front of them all. And it was a very strange configuration. It was uh, bits of sand, bits of seaweed, there were strange bits of rock, and the sea was right out. So we took the helicopter and we, we got up to just above our head and looked down. And we added what uh, 20 to 1 lens means it can go from, well, the picture can get 20 times bigger or 20 times smaller. So if you if you do that and you're 20 to when you zoom out, even if we didn't move, the she would become a, a dot. But we operated that at the same time as giving the helicopter full boost up and the helicopter went up at a speed of knots and the thing went and she went to a, a dot. And then we stuck that on the um, on the screen in the studio, which was the last shot of Victoria. Principal location work finished on Tuesday the 6th of February and on Wednesday the 7th the first of three days interior filming began on stages 3A and B at the BBC's television film studios in Ealing, West London. All of the interior sequences requiring the use of foam were shot at Ealing, as the large amount of water produced during its creation could be more easily controlled there than it could be in an electronic television studio. That said, however, the use of such a large quantity of foam still created problems moment in the studio when the seaweed monsters which are covered in foam are supposed to be coming up in to take over these um, forts where the doctor was and we had a visual effects man who said that this foam was wonderful and it, nothing wrong with it at all but we decided that perhaps he ought to be the seaweed monster who came up in this big plastic tube covered in foam and there was a wonderful moment towards the end of this um, day in the studio when this man was thrashing around in this foam as a piece of seaweed and I can remember him getting slightly panicky and rather claustrophobic and his colleagues having to rush in and pull him out. Unfortunately when they pulled him out and also a lot of the foam and the water went all over the studio floor and um, the powers that be at the BBC weren't at all pleased with this because it made rather a mess of the studio. I was the monster in the seaweed costume which we filmed on a set of the Ealing Studios. I got into position inside this huge Perspex tube which was duly filled with foam. I couldn't see a thing, so I had a string attached to my foot to 
to be pulled as a signal to smash my way out. I thrashed about a bit, waiting for the signal, but no signal came. And at this point, the director decided to change one of the camera positions. By the time the camera was reset, I'd use up all the oxygen in my costume and was beginning to go very dizzy. So I made a final effort that smashed my way out. Luckily, all the cameras were running and we got the shot we wanted. And the whole set was smothered in foam. One of the sets constructed by designer Peter Kindred at Ealing was that representing the base of the gas refinery's impeller shaft, where Van Lutchins is attacked by the weed creature. We shot all those scenes in Ealing Studios and the prop guys on Fury from the Deep were absolutely wonderful. And I can't remember the name of the little bearded fellow with glasses called Peter something who designed the tower. It was about a 30-foot tower and it was about six foot across, like a chimney, and I was at the top of it. At the appropriate moment, a huge tentacle came out of this tower and grabbed me, and I screamed, and it pulled me to the top of the chimney where I, I disappeared. And what they'd done was they, about four feet down, they built a little platform about one foot six by two foot, and I was supposed to land on that and crouch, which I did. But I, I nearly missed my footing. Now, had I missed my footing, I would have dropped 30 feet. But if the shot had been successful, the director would have said, Oh, OK, fine, thank you, John. Cut, everybody, go to tea. And only after about 20 minutes, someone would have said, Well, John's costume hasn't been handing. Where is John, by the way? And, well, I, they, I don't know how they would have got me out. I probably would still be there now, rotting away. With the three days of filming at Ealing completed, the production once again ventured out for a final day's location work on Monday the 12th of February. The venue this time was Denham Aerodrome in Buckinghamshire, home to Gregory Air Services who had provided the helicopters used earlier in the month. The day was spent filming low angle shots of the Doctor, Jamie and Victoria in the helicopter, which would later be intercut with the long distance shots taken at sea of the aircraft in flight. Also on this day, insert shots were filmed of the gas being vented and burnt off at the beach pipeline for episode 2. The rehearsals for episode 1 were completed over a period of four days, from Tuesday the 20th to Friday the 23rd of February. It was during these rehearsals that Hugh David took the opportunity to counsel some of his cast on their performances. Hugh David was just a, a quiet luminous presence I remember he was he was very kind to a young actor like myself at the end of the first week's rehearsal on the final run I was told I think by the producer not by Hugh David that I should smile more and it was being rather grim so I did on the actual shooting day and rather surprised everybody I think I think the name of my character was Lutyens um, I mean I think the worst thing about that thing was my accent, my Dutch accent, uh, which I've mastered now because I've worked so much in Holland, so I, I'm not bothered about it now, but then I, I seem to remember that Hugh David was a bit plaintive about my accent. He thought it was a bit too German. The studio scenes for episode one of Fury from the Deep were recorded in Studio D, Lime Grove, on Saturday the 24th of February. Most of the day, from 10.30 in the morning, was taken up with camera rehearsals whilst the actual recording of the episode was accomplished between 8 o'clock and 9.45 in the evening. Episode 2 was duly recorded the following Saturday, and then on Tuesday the 5th and Wednesday the 6th of March, filming resumed at Ealing Studios, using the large refinery control room set, which would see the final onslaught of foam and seaweed in the last episode, a scene that would have to be accomplished in one take due to its complexity. And the denouement of the whole thing, as I remember, was that we had perspex-type cylinders coming up in, you know, where the scientists, the white coated boffins, could see the gas and uh, monitor everything, and that seaweed figures were going to come in there and sort of bang. Eventually mm. they'd break through and the foam would come. So what we did was to get a number of foam machines and set them up, and this marvellous set with different levels and a 
I think I got four film cameras, and we couldn't rehearse it, you see. We only did once. So uh, I said to all the extras who were sitting around, right, all that's going to happen now is that we're going to fill this place with foam. Now, don't worry about the foam, you can read it. But what you have to do is to get out of this building. And the way out is not to where the cameras are, because there's meant to be a wall where we are. So yes. just have a look around now and see where the exits are. Except that don't go for the nearest exit, otherwise you'll all just a bit too quickly. So you make your way to that exit, and you make your way to that exit, and then you all cross in the middle, and there'll be confusion. Leave it as long as you think you dare before you start running. I didn't know what was going to happen. So they started these things up. Technically, they, the foam had a film fill all the back back area, you know, under the rostra and so mm -hmm. on. And they went on for some time. I thought, I don't know, it was probably about uh, 30 seconds and nothing happened. And the uh, guy was looking around, I said, keep acting. You know, don't look at me, just keep acting. It's going to happen in a moment. For God's sake, we've only got this one girl. So we all kept there like this and suddenly some foam pushed a door open. They did what I asked them to do. They didn't get up too quickly or they got up and they didn't run out. And then suddenly, the place seemingly convulsed and they got up and a lot of them were on a high platform and they left it so when they went down they couldn't see they couldn't actually see where they were and a lot of them panicked and what ensued was fantastic from my point of view because they went down and then they couldn't see so they had to go up again to get their bearings to see where any door was where it was the one i told to go out of or another one so God, how do you get out of here? ah it's coming from here how the hell we get out come on something this way and it was fantastic stuff, you know, real panicking people. So that was one great take, and it was about six inches of water. Recording of episodes 3 to 5 continued over the next three Saturdays, all in Lime Grove Studio D, with episode 4 being committed to tape less than three hours after episode 1 of the story had been broadcast on BBC One. On Friday the 23rd of March, the recording date for episode 5, assistant floor manager Margot Hayhoe found herself having to make an unusual and unplanned contribution to the story. One of the ways of killing off the seaweed monsters was the fact that they didn't like loud noise. And part of the plot at the end was that Victoria would give a piercing scream which made the seaweed monsters disappear. Unfortunately, on the day we were recording this, Deborah Watling had a rather bad cold and decided that she couldn't scream. And Michael Brandt made the decision that I should do the scream. Um, luckily, he didn't give me much notice. He just suddenly turned around and said, Margot, would you like to scream for us in front of the whole studio? Um, I was slightly put off by this, but, you know, the show has to go on sort of thing, so I let out my piercing scream. So I think that's a, probably a little known fact. It was actually me who did the scream, and it was pre-recorded, and Victoria Deborah Watling had to mind to it. So it's a little claim to fame on my part, I suppose, on Doctor Who, probably the only one. For the last episode, noted as the final one on the camera script, recording shifted to Friday and was transferred from the confines of Lime Grove D to the largest studio the BBC owned, Studio One at Television Centre. All six episodes of Fury from the Deep were produced at a cost of £17,576, just under £1,000 more than the estimated budget. Although in hindsight Fury from the Deep is regarded as one of the better Patrick Troughton stories, it was not particularly well received at the time of its transmission. Viewing figures, which had started at 8.2 million for the first episode, gradually dropped down to 5.9 for episode 5, before gaining an extra million for episode 6. Press reaction to the new story was not initially favourable. Following the first episode's transmission, 
Francis Hope wrote in New Statesman magazine, The strains of constant production are beginning to tell. Last week, some rather fierce seaweed gushed out of a ventilator and advanced on the captive Victoria Waterfield. It was only three weeks ago that a similar ventilator admitted billowing clouds of the sinister fungus choking London's underground. The fungus to seaweed is not the widest gamut in the world, and everyone might benefit from a pattern of six weeks on and six weeks off, rather than the present continuous stream of six-episode adventures. That seaweed troubles me, just as it troubles the crew pumping Eurogas out of the North Sea in the year circa 2000. We've already seen some angry clashes of masterful executives which are straight out of the troubleshooters. It's one thing to avoid ludicrous monsters, and another to fall into the old television idiom of romanticised documentary. As Jamie remarked, in so many words, the TARDIS has a statistically improbable tendency to fetch up on Earth. Was this a hint from one scriptwriter to another? Three months later, during the repeat transmission of The Evil of the Daleks, Anne Purser, writing in the stage and television today, commented, The impact that Doctor Who used to have, and only occasionally has had with recent stories, was in the originality of the current monster. Either some new stories must be found, and better than the crazy phone threat, or the BBC should allow Doctor Who to retire gracefully. In the mid-70s, record producer Don Norman, fondly remembering Fury from the Deep, approached Victor Pemberton with the idea of producing a Doctor Who story LP. The result was Doctor Who and the Pascatons, in which Pemberton reused many of the same ideas that had appeared in Fury from the Deep. Creatures from the Sea, a monster defeated by high-pitched sounds, and parasitic seaweed. Eventually, I found myself taking a turn to the right. As I did so, something brushed against me. I couldn't see what it was. I could feel something entwining itself around my ankle, holding me in a vice-like grip. I couldn't move. And now my body. All the life was being squeezed out of me. My arm. Something was wrapping itself around my arm. I dropped the sea lamp. It floated away from me, but as the light filtered back through the darkness, I caught my first glimpse of the alien force that was slowly curling itself around my entire body. A living weed, clinging to me like the tentacles of a giant deep-sea octopus, crushing my bones and preparing to feed off me. It was the same metallic weed that Sarah Jane and I had found on the beach and which was now glistening in the underwater light, its huge emerald eye penetrating the dark, its tentacles strangling me, tugging, dragging me down. The transmission rights to screen Fury from the Deep were purchased by Australia in January 1969, who cleared the story for transmission only after they had made six cuts to the footage to remove what they deemed to be unsuitable material. It was these six physical edits to the film print that were subsequently discovered in 1996 by Damien Shanahan, an Australian fan who tracked the edited 16mm footage down to a repository of the Australian archives. The story was also received and transmitted in both Hong Kong and Singapore. Although when the film print was received in New Zealand on the 1st of December 1970, it was rejected by the New Zealand Broadcasting Corporation and never transmitted. The grinding sound of the dematerializing TARDIS gradually disappeared, and in its place the seabirds returned, swooping low over the surface of the water, searching out the fish that they thought they would never see again. Out and beyond was the vast expanse of sea, the cruel, unyielding sea. Calm again now, the fury gone. All that remained were the small blobs of bubbling white foam and the straggling clumps of seaweed that rolled gently over the waves of the incoming tide.